Snaggle Juice by Paul Finch, read by Dennis Waterman. When Daniel and his sister returned to the big house at the end of Wood Edge Close, he was amazed to see that hardly any of the other properties were left. On one side, where four large semi-detached homes had once stood, wrought iron railings fenced off lush new parkland. On the other, a small industrial plant had appeared, complete with tinted windows and parking bays. At this late hour of the day, it was closed and deserted. Could so much really change in 30 years, he wondered aloud. They just couldn't sell them, Francis explained, pulling up on the drive. Eventually, the families living there flitted and the council was forced to buy up the land. Daniel nodded, but he was no longer listening. He climbed out of the car and gazed up at the building which for so many years had been his childhood home. At least this was unchanged. It was still perched on high ground overlooking the end of the close. It still had a steep front garden, stepped and filled with glorious flowers. It still had its big bay windows and the front door of heavy oak. You've kept it nicely, he said. She walked stiffly up the drive and let herself in. It hasn't been easy since Mum and Dad died. There was a faint hint of accusation in her voice, and she allowed the words to hang in the air as she moved through into the hall and started turning lights on. Daniel followed her inside. The same brolly rack sat by the door, the same telephone table stood next to it, the same stained glass windows looked down on the staircase to the left. On the right, the same doors led off to the lounge and dining room. At the far end of the passage, he could see the kitchen. Gleaming new units and white tiles were visible. That had changed, he thought. But perhaps that was inevitable. Thirty years, though. It seemed incredible that he'd been away for so long. In fact, he'd only been back in the house ten seconds and it had already seemed that he'd never left. Francis came back down the corridor, unbuttoning her Mac. His older sister had certainly changed, too. She was heavier set than he ever remembered, walked painfully and had a full head of grey hair. She couldn't have been fifty yet. But like so many other people he knew, she'd aged prematurely. She gave him a gentle look as she hung her coat up, then went through into the kitchen and put the kettle on. That was the closest Daniel's sister ever came to a smile. She'd been renowned for it since childhood. He laughed to himself. <laughs> Nothing had changed there, then. He laid his bag down and walked in after her. I'm sorry I didn't get to the funerals, he said. At first she made no reply but couldn't hold back her disapproval indefinitely. It's not as if you couldn't have. I know, I'm sorry. There was an awkward silence between them as she made a pot of tea. It must have been awful, he suddenly said. Finding them both there like that, in the lounge, together. She shrugged and handed him a steaming mug. He wondered what their parents' note had said, which surprised her. Well, what do you think it said? She almost snapped. Daniel drank his tea in silence, then looked darkly out of the window into the sloping back garden. At its farthest point, there was still a gap in the hedge, where an old footpath led down into the darkened morass of the valley. He took everything from us, didn't he? He said bitterly. Francis looked round in surprise at him. Who? Snaggletooth, he replied. His sister shook her head in resignation. Danny, just don't start all that again, please, not now. She hobbled through to the lounge and sat down on the sofa. Daniel appeared in the doorway behind her. Still insisting he doesn't exist, he wondered. What if I told you that he once came into this house? Francis tried not to look astonished. Oh, yes, Daniel went on, about two nights after he killed that girl walking a dog in the valley. Around midnight it was. I was in bed, he, he just came into my room. I can still see all that straggling hair, those crazy eyes, that god-awful tooth. I don't know why he didn't attack me. He just stood there, towering over me, grinning, for about a minute. Then he was gone. She looked hard at him as if trying to work him out once and for all. It never occurred to you that you might have been having a nightmare? Daniel shook his head. It wasn't a nightmare that murdered Brendan Richards the next week, was it? <laughs> <laughs>
or young Michael Bately the month after that. Oh, for God's sake, Danny, you've got to stop all this. She clambered quickly to her feet and stormed out. A few minutes later, he heard a door slam somewhere upstairs. Daniel couldn't stop it, of course. He wouldn't stop it. It was why he'd come back to this house in the first place. How could he have forgotten that quite appalling Saturday afternoon in the sewer pipe, when he'd watched Snaggletooth slaughter his young friend Michael? It was burned into his memory. Everyone had always said to avoid that sewer pipe. It was used to bring effluent into the river and wasn't supposed to be a very safe place to play, which, of course, had made he and his friends want to explore as far up it as possible. If you crouched down low enough, it was easy to move along it, and the filthy stream of effluent was only ever ankle-deep, if it was there at all. What they hadn't expected, though, was to venture up it one afternoon and find Snaggletooth waiting there. Icy sweat broke on Daniel's brow as he remembered it all. If only they'd listened to the policeman who'd been to school telling them all to stay out of the valley, because there'd been two horrible murders there. If only they'd paid any attention. Even thirty years later... Daniel could still feel himself crushed up into a ball of abject terror, the stinking water flowing over him full of fresh blood. He could hear the gibbering screams coming down the pipe towards him. He could see the big hands around Michael's throat, the twisted yellow tooth as it slashed and tore at his face, the frenzy of hair as the abominable, indescribable thing tossed its head in ecstasy. When he looked up again at the sombre furnishings of the lounge, he... His cheeks were sodden with tears. Why the hell hadn't anyone believed him? Why hadn't they gone and got hold of the monster? For all anyone knew, it was still down there in the valley. Not that it would be for much longer. As he'd repeatedly told himself on the long journey home, he wasn't coming all the way back here for nothing. Daniel went out into the hall, knelt down and unzipped his bag... From under the few dog-eared paperbacks and bits of clothing, he took out his most prized possession, a gleaming, sawn-off shotgun. Twelve bore, double barreled and with a special cut-down stop for greater manoeuvrability and concealment. The circles he'd moved in over the last few years had been beneficial to him in more ways than one. With a chuckle, he broke the gun open and inserted two cartridges. A gasp of fright came down the stairs. He looked up sharply and found Frances standing there in her dressing gown. Her lined face was waxy white. Her hands clawed on the stair rail. What? What in the name of God is that? Daniel returned her gaze boldly, slammed the breech closed and shoveled a few more handfuls of cartridges into his jacket pockets before standing up. None of you believe me. None of you. Not even you, Fran. Well... We're going to do it the hard way. I'm going to go down the valley and get Snaggletooth myself. I suppose it should be down to me after everything that's happened to our family. For God's sake, Danny, she cried out. But he ignored her and moved through into the kitchen. She hobbled down the stairs and went after him as quickly as she could. Snaggletooth does not exist. You know that, Danny, you know that. Without a backward glance, he led himself out into the rear garden through the kitchen door. The misty gloom of a late summer night had now descended in full, and the air was dank and reeked of sap. Daniel strode quickly down the garden to the gap in the hedge, Francis struggling after him, pleading for reason. When he reached the hedge, he stopped and turned. She came breathlessly up to him, eyes wet with tears. Danny, this is madness, she stammered. Do you know what the police will do if they find you wandering around the valley with a weapon like that? The police, he scoffed. A lot of good they were when we needed them most. Danny, Snaggletooth is a fantasy, she asserted, grabbing his arm. An illusion, you surely realise that by now. Angrily, he pulled away and cut through the cleft in the hedge, descending into the valley through the dense hawthorn breaks. Are you telling me I didn't know what I saw? He growled. She clapped a hand to her face. Danny! You didn't know what was going on because you were just a child. For God's sake, must I spell it out? Where do you think you've been for the last 30 years? His expression betrayed sullen disappointment. And after all this time, you still don't believe I was innocent? <laughs>
She shook her head sadly. I believe that you didn't know what you were doing. Everyone was prepared to accept that. But Danny, the, the evidence was overwhelming. You came out of that sewer pipe drenched in blood. Heaven, it was even in your mouth. When they searched the house, they found the dog's lead in your bedroom. It, it was the one missing from the scene of that girl's murder. Daniel shook his head violently. But, Francis, I didn't know how it got there. I don't, I don't, I don't. She threw her arms around him to calm him. I know, I know, my darling. That's why they sent you to hospital rather than to prison. For a moment, she spoke soothingly to him, like a mother, insisting that it was all over now, that it was all behind him, that it hadn't been his fault that he'd been forgiven, that he'd paid his dues, that after years of rehabilitation, they decided he was fit to return to society. But it was only under license, of course, and strictly under his sister's supervision. She pecked him tenderly on the cheek, then stepped back. You have to realize, darling, that things can't be like they were before. Not just yet. You'll have to stay indoors most of the time, and the police will be checking on you regularly. The only reason they let you come back to our house was because we're now the only ones living in the close. Now, please, come on. It's for the best. It really is. After a thoughtful moment, he nodded and smiled. She smiled sadly back. But not for long. For as he looked at her, there was suddenly a subtle change in Daniel's eyes. A chill ran down Francis's spine. Her brother's face had now gone as hard as rock. Without a word, he lifted the shotgun to his shoulder, pointing it directly at his sister. Her eyes widened in disbelief as he slowly, deliberately cocked both barrels. His finger tightened on the trigger. Danny! The first payload took her in the chest flinging her back against the tree trunk with shocking force, the second in the head, smashing it to bone and jellied brains. As the smoke cleared, she slithered slowly to the forest floor. Daniel gazed down at her for a moment, then fell to one knee and began to grope about in the glistening, pulpy mess. After a minute, he found the piece of evidence he was looking for and held it up in the moonlight. It was long, twisted, and sharp. He shook his head in stunned bewilderment. No wonder, no wonder nobody ever saw you smile, Fran. <laughs> <laughs>